And as usual, please join us, put your thoughts, comments here, and we will feed them over to our guests today. Uh, we've got David and Jonas Stillman, father and son duo. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Um, and they are the authors of this new book that made me feel really old um, called Gen Z at Work, How the Next Generation is Transforming the Workplace. Um, and so I think this is really interesting because we've got David, who's a member of Gen X, and his son Jonah, who is a member of Gen Z, um, writing this book together. So uh, it'll be really interesting. As, as usual, like I said, please put your comments and we'll throw them to them. So guys, why did you write this book and what was the process like? Uh, you know, we wrote this book because there's so much talk about the millennial generation and a big misconception is that, you know, anyone under 30 is a millennial and therefore people try to treat our generation, Gen Z, like the millennials and that will backfire as we start to enter the workforce because we are raised differently and therefore we will act differently in the workforce. And Writing a book with my dad was definitely an adventure. It was fun. Uh, you know, he said, just like a typical Gen X dad, he made me work hard. He made me earn, do a lot of training writing for both the book and the public speaking that we do. He always told me, like, there's no such thing as a participation award. And if anyone gets one, it's him because he helped me get to where we are today. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> So uh, so then why did you write this? Because you, you've written other books. Yeah, so I've been saying the generations now for 20 years. And I remember when Gen X showed up, everyone tried to treat us like the baby boomers, and that backfired big time. And I saw the same dialogue about to happen all over again. Because as Jonah mentioned, a lot of buzz about the millennials. Everyone thinks that someone under 30 is the same. And yet we did three national studies, and we found that Gen Z is radically different than the millennials. And I said, you know, if we treat Gen Z like the millennials, history will repeat itself. So I was really excited to find out what makes this generation unique and what we could teach organizations and leaders that they need to do in order to prepare. The leading edge of Gen Z is graduating college this spring and it's 72.8 million strong. They really are going to be different. Yeah, and so I talk about some of the main differences. I know you kind of you look at them like you looked at the politics for example and, and saying how millennials felt more inspired by politics whereas Gen Z feels a little bit more uh, just stultified about it. Uh, but first, talk about the politics. What, what, what are the main differences between millennials versus Gen Z? Well, I mean, if you think about it, millennials post 9 11 did see uh, Republicans and Democrats reach across the aisle and truly collaborate and work together. You compare that to Jonah's generation, his whole life he's only seen Republicans bash Democrats, Democrats bash Republicans, and work against each other. And as a result, only 3% of Gen Z right now believe in the political process and even see politicians as true leaders. So we have a lot of work to do with this generation. Yeah, and, and so Jenna, like, what, do you reflect those statistics? Like, I mean, do you have more hope for kind of what's happening in politics right now? Um, I mean, like you said, a lot of us still need to be convinced. And part of the reason is that because Gen Z isn't really even talked about with the politics. You hear a lot about the young vote, and that young vote, really what they're talking about is the millennials. And actually, Gen Z voted for the first time in this past election. And all this talk about, you know, we have this young vote, they got to get the attention. Never once were they referring to Gen Z. So until people and politicians are willing to invite Gen Z into the political conversation, it's going to be hard to convince us that we really are an important aspect to the vote. But uh, there are a lot of military veterans who were certainly spoken about in the election, absolutely, and they would fall in this category. But they were still called millennials, and so you have a generation uh -huh. saying, hey, you know, that's not us. You got to get to know us, and I think what we're going to really have to do is, number one, invite them into the political process and acknowledge that they're different than millennials. Beyond that, what I believe we're going to need to do is give them really tangible things that they can work on, grassroots, not grandiose big missions that are going to take years and years and years to execute. I think we have to give them tangible, smaller, pragmatic examples where they can be proven that their voice and actions really will make a difference. Sure, and I know one of the things you guys found in your research that Gen Z is really concerned about is student debt, and those issues weren't discussed uh, too much, especially in the general, but uh, I know you mentioned also in the book that the Teal Scholarship that encourages people to drop out of college and start a business. Um, I, I, I happen to support that view of, of you know being much more strategic about going to college and thinking about student debt. Um, do you think Gen Z is more mindful of that than millennials? Definitely. Uh, we hear across the board that Gen Zers feel pressured by teachers, parents, employers that we need to know exactly what we want to do before we enter college. Because if we're going to go in and spend a hundred plus thousand dollars on a four-year degree, we should know what we want to do and how we can get that most effectively. In fact, we know that 67 percent of Gen Z indicate their top concern is being able to afford college. So uh, maybe they're more uh, conservative in how they think about. I mean, a criticism that I've heard about 
millennials is they haven't thought of college as an investment. They think of it as a consumption, that it's like a, almost a lifestyle experience versus this is an investment where I need an ROI. Do you agree with that criticism of millennials? Well, yes, but I think, you know, they were they came of age during economic prosperity. They had boomer parents telling them they could be and do anything. So I'm not willing to criticize millennials. I think it was just a different time. What I would say about Gen Z, however, is that 61% of Gen Z said, I need to know what I want to be before I even enter college. So think about how that changes the value proposition. It used to be, come to college and figure that out. Now we have an entire generation showing up already knowing what they want to do. And so higher ed's really struggling because the value proposition has truly changed. Yeah, I mean, do you think college is even relevant for a lot of Gen Zers compared to previous generations? Or have we kind of jumped the shark on college for a lot of Gen Zers? No, college is definitely still relevant, but what we're definitely seeing is that higher ed is already struggling. They're one of the few areas that is seeing Gen Z the changes already, and they really need to convince us that it's worth it. Because if I'm somebody that knows that I want to be, say, a plumber, it's going to be harder to convince me that a four-year degree is worth it when I could save a lot of money and go to a trade school, per se, and get that degree much, or get that skill much faster. I think a big challenge is if you think about liberal arts degrees, a lot of Gen Z is going to feel these classes, Greek civilization, art history, don't get me wrong, important classes, but to this generation, it's going to feel like they're focused on the past. And here's a generation that wants to see a direct connection between what they're learning and how it applies to the future. So we're finding colleges and universities that incorporate things like internships will have a leg up um, on the other higher ed because they are seeing that direct connection between, oh, here's what I'm learning and how it applies. Well, and that seems to be something that Senator Tim Scott, Marco Rubio have been very focused on this sort of occupational training and hands-on training, real-world experience training. Uh, it seems, at least on Capitol Hill, there are some people who are echoing this. I think both sides of the aisle are echoing the need that the generation has to understand how what they're learning and how it applies. I don't think it's a difference between the two parties, but I think the attention now is higher ed needs some reinvention so that we keep this generation interested. But how do you do that? Because there's certainly entrenched interest to keep the system status quo at the university level. I think one thing you have to incorporate is more real world experiences. We're seeing some universities bring in businesses to help them revamp curriculum so they can see the relevance. I also think we're going to have to look at costs. I think you see a lot of this generation maybe doing community education um, for the first couple of years and then maybe transferring to a bigger university. They're just going to be a lot more savvy because finances are playing such a huge role. Mm -hmm. We've got a, a question here from Shirley. She says, what are their work ethics? Um, well, this generation has a strong work ethic. Uh, because they grew up with the recession uh, during their formative years, they also had Gen X parents telling them, you know, it's a tough world out there. We have a generation now um, that's willing to roll up their sleeves and work. Gen X, Gen Z rather, comes to the job feeling very lucky to have a job. We compare that to millennials where the criticism was always, oh, this job's lucky to have me. Entitled. Yeah. Um, well, they just were told, you're going to be great, things are awesome, so they came to work feeling, this job's lucky to have me. Again, you know, we can't necessarily criticize the millennials per se, the, the rest of us were the ones delivering those messages. Sure, of course. No, I mean, that's, a, that's the thing about, uh, the, the old generation can't complain because they produce the younger generation. <laughs> I always say the irony is the same ones who are complaining to me about them are the same ones who raised them, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Christopher wants to know, tell me about your research methods. Uh, so yeah, we partnered with a program at my local high school, Minnetonka High School in Minnesota called Vantage. It's an off-campus business immersion program to field three national studies um, of a representative of the entire United States of all demographics. And so then we brought in the Institute for Corporate Productivity. They've done the research for all my other books and we did three national services, as Jonah mentioned, across the country to say we took 15 to 22 year olds because at 15 you have an idea of what you want to be. Uh, in your life, and so we focused on that demographic. Really, what are you interested in the workplace? And you've looked at prior generations too, using the same methodology. I have. I've been yeah. studying the generations now. This is my 20th year, so we've looked at traditionalists, boomers, Xers, millennials, and now so excited to be looking at Gen Z. And what really excites me about this is the leading edge is now graduating this spring, so leaders and organizations have a chance to be proactive, not reactive. Oftentimes, for the past 20 years, when I've been brought in, you know, we've waited too long. I think higher ed's waited too long, but the workplace now is next and we have an opportunity to be proactive here, and which really excites us, on top of getting to do it with my amazing Gen Z son. <laughs> uh, and what about um, demographics? Because I know that, I mean, I'm a millennial, I'm a grandma millennial on the older end, but 
w my generation, we're 42% non-white, whereas the babies born today are majority non-white. And, and that's very different from how, you know, America has really ever looked. Um, and, you know, I saw that you guys had gone to the Iowa caucus, which Iowa is, is not really a, the most diverse of places you can look demographically. Do you think our political system is equipped to kind of meet the changing demographics of the younger generations? I do, because I, I have hope that we're paying attention more and we're realizing that, you know, the, the Gen Z will actually be the last majority white generation and we're seeing, you know, other populations and I do believe that we're becoming more and more ready for a diverse and this generation, um, you know, they're more just comfortable with diversity. So I think the conversation, they're more willing to have it. For the rest of us, sometimes we get a little tongue-tied. Diversity is a little bit scarier thing to talk about. I have found in our focus groups and our research with Gen Z that they really are great at talking about diversity. I think that's the first step. You gotta talk about it, put it on the table, and oftentimes those conversations are gonna be led, I believe, by the younger generation. So as I've gotten to know them, I'm very hopeful. Yeah, well, and I think that that's, I mean, certainly right now in this country, I mean, in the last several years, you look at Gallup polling on race relations among black and white Americans, that that's really deteriorated right now. Um, what's your sense in terms of how we can recover that? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think the challenge is going to really be starting with the dialogue. What we're finding is that this generation is a little bit more colorblind. You know, so oftentimes I think they feel it's the other generations that are creating the turmoil and the conversations, and they're willing to have them. Um, the other thing you got to remember is that. You know, they don't remember phones that weren't smart. So they're just exposed to a diverse world, not only here in our country, but internationally. So when they see something happen far overseas, they often feel that that happened to them too. Where, you know, for my generation growing up, we were very US centric. So it's not even just the diversity within our country. Here's a generation that feels very global and aware, and they're bringing that sense of diversity to the conversation. And I mean, and what was your sense, Jonah, as you watched the campaign and uh, because yes, I mean, younger people are more likely to have a passport or travel abroad, but our president, the message on campaign trail where that globalization is a bad thing, that we really should be America first. Do you think, I mean, what was your sense in terms of watching that and then also, as you've done your research, is there a disconnect between Gen Zers and what's happening in the White House? Um, I think just in general, Gen Z is struggling to connect with politics as a whole, as we mentioned earlier. And as we did focus groups with multiple groups of different Gen Zers at local high schools at the Iowa caucus, like we mentioned we were at, we thought that whether or not our president was white or black, eventually we cared more front about the campaign that they were going to run, the causes that they cared about. And eventually we figured that we'd see a president of all races, genders in our lifetime. So first and foremost was the cause that we cared about for our candidate. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like nationalization or nationalism, uh, would you say that Gen Zers are nationalistic or are they more uh, apathetic about that? Uh, we didn't do deep research into that. There's probably people who have studied that side of uh -huh. politics a little bit better than us. But I will say I think this generation, sure, security, you know, front and center them. This is a generation where they've seen scarier things get closer and closer to home. I mean, school bomb threats and, you know, it's a scary. You have kids walking through metal detectors now to get into high school. So security is front and center for this generation. Um, and so I think that's going to be important. In terms of how we address security, you know, I think this generation, obviously, if it makes us safer, great. And time will tell to see if the policies that are being put in place truly do make us safer. So I think it'd be security front and center for this generation because, you know, it's a war that's not only taking place in the classroom, but even cyber terrorism. It doesn't really go away. Where the rest of us had wars that came to an end, you know, whether it be Vietnam War, the Korean War, for this generation, they don't see an end to the war and terrorism necessarily, so they want us to feel safer and safer at home. Well, and what about privacy, too? Because that gets into issues of privacy. I can't imagine that Gen Zers feel like they have privacy. I mean, with the ubiquity of the smartphone. I mean, Jonah, do you think that <coughs> you have privacy? Uh, privacy, well, one thing that we've known is that Gen Z compared to the millennial generation actually is a much more private generation. Uh, for example, if you look at what millennials launch, they launch apps like Facebook and the most public platform of, of all. You can let everyone know what you're doing at any time. And Gen Z, we're much more private when it comes to social media. We're not really on Facebook as much. We're more on the Snapchat side of things where I take a picture, I choose who I want to send it to, I tell them how long they can see it for, and after that it vanishes. So I think Gen Z, you're going to see more of a side where we take control of 
who sees what when we put it on the internet because it was hammered into our heads at a young age from Gen X parents like my dad that we have to be careful what we put on the internet because one day when we're applying for a job or if we're applying for schools, it could come back and haunt us. Sure. No, I think millennials were kind of the guinea pigs on that front. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, if you're just joining us, we're here with David and Jonah Stillman. They are the co-authors, father and son team of Gen Z at Work, How the Next Generation is Transforming the, the Workplace. Please feel free to put your questions here. Um, I want to talk about the freelance economy and the gig economy because you guys look at that and how Gen Zers have totally different uh, thoughts about what the workplace is going to look like. I mean, my grandpa worked at a steel mill. He was in the union. Um, he got, you know, I think he got like a, he, I think he got physically like a steel bowl or something because he worked at the steel mill when he got, when he uh, retired. Uh, I mean, that just seems like antiquated right now, uh, and your research confirms that. I'm not sure John will be jazzed about a steel bowl. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's something that we talk a lot about in our book. Something called the side hustle. You know, here's a generation that is going to have a side hustle where they're going to come to a job but also have something going on in the side. It used to be, well, it's an either or. Either I'm going to go work full time or I'm going to have my own gig on the side. And here's a generation that I truly believe is going to want to do both. And, I mean, if you think about for this generation, it's a lot easier to start a business. Yeah, and like the whole side hustle thing, you're now starting to see companies advertise the side hustle. For example, Uber is now running an entire advertising campaign about the side hustle. You can have your full-time job and then on the side you can drive for Uber because it is a great example of a side hustle. And starting a business like my dad mentioned does not feel like a big deal. For example, if I wanted to start a business within two days because the barrier to entry has become so easy, I could file for my LLC, design a logo, have a 1-800 number that, does, that forwards right to my cell phone, have business cards and a custom logo, just like that. So starting a business for Gen Z really does not feel like a big Sure, deal. but how are the employers going to feel about that? Because I can't imagine it, whether it's a competitor or even just the, the, the time and energy that you're putting into someone else's business versus your side hustle. I mean, what, what was your sense in terms of how employers think about that? Right, so of course there's the whole nine to five structure where if you're working for said company, you're supposed to be doing that right then from that nine to five time. But then the way you can look at it is challenge it if I'm working for you from 9 to 5, am I expected to respond to your email at 7 o'clock when you email me at night? And what we've challenged and what we see people doing is challenging them is to instead of judge your employer on when they're working, it's based on performance. If, are they getting their job done? If they're getting their job done, then it shouldn't really matter when and where they're going to do their work. I mean, side hustles have been going on for a long time. It's just mm -hmm. that we didn't talk about We call them moonlighting. <laughs> they have the sign you didn't really talk about. Where what's neat about this generation is they will put it out there because they feel that shows I'm very entrepreneurial, shows I'm innovative. And, but you brought up a good point. I think employers, first of all, like Jonah mentioned, are going to have to focus on performance, not when work gets done. But the other thing they're going to have to focus on is that compete issue. You know, if I work for a company and it's completely separate, it, we might have to let it go. But... We're going to have to bring non-competes to the table and talk about them definitely because one thing we know is 75% um, of Gen Z wishes that their side hobby could become a full-time job. So side hustles are going to be definitely out there um, and the employees are going to have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we got another question here, a follow-up from Christopher. Uh, he said, this sounds quite U.S.-centric. Different political interest levels here in the U.K. Any plans to look at other countries in your research? Great question. We're really excited because we just signed on last week to take our uh, research study that we've done on Gen Z in the U.S. and run it in 11 other countries. We want to get a feel for what it's like here, put this book out here, and our whole goal with Gen Z at work is to pioneer a dialogue that not enough people are having. And Christopher is right on because what we now want to do is say, okay, we know they're global. What does this look like around the world? One prediction that I have is that Gen Z is going to be very similar globally because they're so connected. Um, and so we're really excited to take a look and, you know, hopefully we'll come back on your show and talk about our sure. findings. What countries about, are you going to? Um, I knew you were going to say that. The UK, Europe, <laughs> um, parts of Africa, Australia, South America. Um, uh, I know I'm forgetting one. I'm going to be... Uh, oh, but uh, those we're, are continents, we're, but okay. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, continents, sorry. But yeah, so um, we're, we're looking at continents wrong. Brazil oh, was one of them. Yep. Oh, that'll be interesting. Yeah. yeah, well, and I think in general, too, I mean, when you look at... Uh, like like Africa, I mean, yeah. most African countries are so much younger than than America. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would imagine, I mean, in some of these places, Gen Z is is the majority even. Um, so the dynamic, uh, the, the power structures, I would imagine, would be very different. And how parenting structures are different. I mean, one big influence on a generation is how they're parented. You know, we know, for example, in Asian cultures, uh, parent, parental and grandparent influence is really big, and so. 
I think you know that type of dynamic is going to be different than we find in maybe some other countries and continents. And so, uh, you know, time will tell, and we'll we're definitely excited to do the research. Sure. Yeah. yeah it's very interesting. Um, question here: What trends do you see when analyzing past generations as time progresses? Um, you know, well, what I do find is that it's the events and conditions that shape a generation. And because you live through certain events and conditions, you adopt a generational personality that really doesn't change over time. And I've been able to prove that in the past 20 years. Baby boom generation, still very competitive, idealistic, and optimistic. Compared to my generation, still a very skeptical generation. We look at millennials, very collaborative. So what happens is you take this generational personality into every single life stage. A lot of times people sort of have this attitude well, I'm going to wait to get to know Gen Z, and what they really want to say, I'm going to wait till they become a little bit more like me as they get older. But you'll find the older you get, you're even more entrenched in your generational personality. And savvy leaders will take a look at who is Gen Z and how do I need to adapt, anticipating their entree into the workforce and then into management and so on. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting what's happening uh, because I think when I see most news broadcasts talking about what's happening on college campuses right now, there, there are a lot of protests. Uh, people who are feeling like conservatives have not had a, a fair shake in terms of speakers. And you know, it, at Berkeley, they you know were protesting Milo. Whatever you think about him, he's uh, certainly a provocateur. But even even just Condoleezza Rice being shut out from you know speaking at, at college campuses. Is your sense that Gen Z versus Millennials are more open to this, you know, challenging their ideas, or, or are they, clo they close like Millennials? No, I think Gen Z is very open yeah. to talking about it. But again, I mean, part of probably what they're seeing is just that. They're seeing Republicans bash Democrats, Democrats bash Republicans. Only 3%, as Jonah mentioned, of Gen Z believes in the political process right now. So step one, got to acknowledge them. Step two, invite them into a dialogue and be willing to have it and don't make it so much about you know, the fight because what they'll do is, and they're very smart about, they're just going to work around the system and quite candidly as they should. Sure. No, uh, I think that that's um, a very tech-centric generation in terms of just use technology. Don't wait, don't wait for the, the humans at the top to deal with it. <laughs> Uh, or have technology work with. I mean, sure. there's definitely a very powerful mm -hmm. place for technology to get the message out there, to have a dialogue. I mean, here's a generation that, you know, through Twitter and through other platforms can have real conversations. The problem is a lot of those conversations really aren't dialogues at all. They're just, you know, arguments and bashing, which to them doesn't feel very, you know, productive. Sure. And so, Joey, you're, you're graduating high school this spring. What are your plans? Uh, my plans for next year as of now is uh, I will either be going to a university and continuing the public speaking that I do and the generational work, or I'm considering taking a gap year to look at other projects as we start to do the global research. If there's opportunities to do some more stuff that will take up all my time, I'd be happy to continue doing that. Cool. And what advice do you have for employers who are looking to hire Gen Z? Definitely. I think first and foremost, you just got to acknowledge that we are a new generation. We are different than millennials, which means we're going to act differently. And as soon as you realize that we're not better than the millennials, we're not worse than the millennials, we're just different, that's when you're going to learn to work with us best. And three major differences, main difference. I know we talked about some, but Definitely. just to distill it. I think one of the ones that you're going to see first and foremost, the most important, is the collaborative versus private. Gen or millennials excuse me, are the most collaborative generation there is. And now that's because the way they were raised, like my dad mentioned, they were told that if they work together and they work hard, everything's going to be all right. And then Gen Z were raised to be a little bit more focused. We were told there's winners and losers, so we're a much more private and focused generation. And I think independent means 71% of Gen Z said they believe in the phrase, if you want it done right, do it yourself. So look, take it something like office space, right? What have most offices done? They've gone to open office concept, but that's to really appease collaborative millennials. Whereas Gen Z, they much more private and independent. Only 8% of Gen Z said they want open office concepts. So much so that 35% <laughs> said they'd rather share socks than an office space. <laughs> you know, so you've got Joe you Domenici, know, this collaborative yeah. versus independent. Another thing you have is collaborative versus competitive. Gen Z is a very competitive generation. Uh, millennials were told, you know, if we all pitch in together, we can all win. But Gen Z really feels, you know, competitive and I'm going to want your job. So I think you know we're going to anticipate some big clashes there. Um, I guess another difference I'd put out there is that uh, millennials came of age during a time of great prosperity. You know, and They also had parents telling them they could be and do anything they wanted to be. Very different than this generation that had the recession and Gen X parents telling them it's a tough world out there. So what you're going to see is a much more realistic generation. 
So millennials bought into grandiose missions. I think this generation is going to want things a little bit more pr pragmatic. You had millennials saying, you know, I want meaning on the job. I want to change the world. This generation wants to change the world, but number one on their list was pay. I know I want to earn a good living, and then hopefully I can change the world. Interesting. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch my back, Jonah, because you might try to compete yeah. and get my jobs. <laughs> <laughs> He's already but, taking mine, so hey. <laughs> it's, it's working. So David and Jonah Stillman, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Again, their book uh, is Gen Z at Work, uh, How the Next Generation is Transforming the Workplace. Um, stay tuned here on Salon Talks at noon. Andrew O'Hare will be live with Katrina Van Vanden Heuvel. She's the editor and publisher of The Nation, and they're going to talk about the consequences of electing Donald Trump. Stay tuned.